schoolboy, a young George Washington is known to have written out by hand a list of 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. The list, which was compiled by Jesuit teachers for young men, included precepts such as the following. Every action done in company ought to be with some sign of respect to those that are present. Shake not the head, feet, or legs, roll not the eyes, lift not one eyebrow higher than the other, <laughs> wry not the mouth, and bedew no man's face with your spittle by approaching too near him when you speak. <laughs> Spit not into the fire, nor stoop too low before it, neither put your hands into the flames to warm them, nor set your feet upon the fire, especially if there be meat before it. <laughs> now times have changed quite a bit since the 18th century, and at least in this part of the country, we don't have to worry too much about people putting their feet in our fires while we're trying to cook dinner. <laughs> But civility is our spiritual theme of the month here at USG. And most of the rules of civility that Washington had written out as a young boy could be described as rules of etiquette, conventions of acceptable behavior in society, a way of minding our manners. The Latin root of civility means citizen, and so we can understand civility to also mean a quality of interaction amongst ourselves as citizens, as people of the same society. Civility is all about how we treat one another. It applies to how we treat those that we know well, as well as those who are strangers to us. And today, I want to focus especially on that aspect of civility that pertains to our public and political lives. Now, the word civility seems to have gone out of fashion today. Instead of civility in our public discourse, we find polarization, rancor, and discord. This is most evident, of course, on the national level, where our members of Congress seem to be always in conflict, and where debate over national legislation like the Affordable Care Act has, seems to bring out the worst in us instead of the best. A member of the House of Representatives was actually spat on by protesters back in 2010 as he was entering the Capitol building to place his vote on that piece of health care legislation. I guess the protester hadn't read or gotten a lesson in the 110 rules of civility like George Washington had. And now I don't want to suggest that the political discord that we are experiencing today is somehow unique to our times. There has always been tension in our political life as a democracy. However, the level of aggressive disagreement and bitterness does seem to be taking its toll on our general attitude towards politics. A 2010 study that was conducted by Allegheny College looked at American attitudes towards contemporary politics today. And the vast majority of those surveyed, over 95%, believe that civility is important to a healthy democracy, yet at the same time, nearly 50% believe that there has been a decline in the tone of our politics, especially since Barack Obama became president of the United States. Now it would be pretty easy to get into a blame game of which political party is more guilty of the negative tactics than the other, and that's not something I intend to do this morning. You can have that side conversation over coffee if you wish. What's more important for us to consider as spiritual beings who are gathered here this morning is how the tone of our public and political life affects our souls and how we might in turn find the spiritual wherewithal to impact our life in community for the better. Incivility in the public sphere places a spiritual toll on us on a communal and a personal level. 
As the Lao Tzu reading makes clear, we are connected beings and we can trace peace on a national or a global level down to peace in our cities and between neighbors, in our home and in our hearts. And I believe that the inverse is also true, that if we wish to have peace in our hearts, we need to have peace in our homes and between neighbors and in our cities and nations and the world. So promoting civility in our civic and our public life is a spiritual matter that affects our personal and communal peace and well-being. And how is it then that we relate civilly with our neighbors in our cities and in our nations? There is one school of thought that says good fences make good neighbors. This old adage is repeated in Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall. In this poem, two men meet every year to mend the stone wall that lines their properties. And it's in, during the year damaged by hunters and others passing through, so they get together to mend it. And the narrator decides that he might try to dissuade his neighbor from putting the fence back up. Why do they make good neighbors, he asks. Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, or to whom I was like to give a fence. Something there is that doesn't like a wall, that wants it down. The good fences make good neighbors mentality says that if we keep a safe distance and put the right kind of barrier between us, then we can all get along just fine. This type of thinking is what makes it easier to live in fear of the other, to alienate ourselves, especially from those who are not like us. But another school of thought and living says that those fences are actually what keep us divided from one another. We are diminished by what we wall in or wall out. We can't, in fact, be good neighbors if we only have a partial view of one another through the slats of that fencing that we put up. So our task as religious people striving towards a common good is not to put up walls, but to build bridges between us. We ought not use good fences to be good neighbors, but find ways to connect across those apparent divisions that separate us. Building bridges is, of course, not an easy task or without its challenges. As Parker Palmer says, America's public life is a vital, colorful, and chaotic bazaar. It is a beautiful and wonderful thing to be a part of such a vibrant society where people come from all around the world and speak all kinds of languages, where people praise God or don't praise God, where we use our freedom of thought to think of the best way forward for our nation. And given both the demographic diverse, diversity and diversity of opinions that is present in our society, promoting civility becomes a question of how we navigate that diversity with respect and with openness. As Parker Palmer writes, the civility we need will not come from watching our tongues. It will come from valuing our differences. The civility we need is not a passive sort of niceness, but an active engagement, especially with those who think and believe differently from us. Now, as Unitarian Universalists, we like to think of ourselves as tolerant and respectful people on the whole. We work hard to maintain covenants of right relationship with one another. Yet if we took a hard look at our networks and the circles that we are a part of, we would probably conclude that we spend the vast majority of our time with people who, even if they're of different racial or ethnic or religious backgrounds, share our basic worldview. And this is certainly true in my own life. I know that the people who I have the most contact with on a regular basis are typically more on the liberal side, both politically and theologically. 
They are mostly of similar educational backgrounds, and we probably learn about the world through similar media and news outlets. It is much easier for most of us to let ourselves gravitate towards people who make us feel comfortable, who are most like us. We want that sense of safety and security that comes from being amongst like-minded people. And of course, there is a place for that. That's probably what brings most of us here to the Unitarian Society of Germantown. Yet it is also a habit of the heart and a spiritual practice to engage diversity in all of its many forms. And it, does, it doesn't just happen naturally. It takes a bit of effort to do that. Now one way to engage with difference is to just approach it head on, to purposely find people with whom you have major differences of opinion and to make that the focus of conversation, but to do so with respect and a desire to understand one another. And this is exactly what the founders of an organization called Reach Out Wisconsin have aimed to do. You may recall an especially bitter time in Wisconsin politics recently if you're plugged into the national news. Shortly after Governor Scott Walker took office in 2010, he introduced a controversial budget proposal that drastically cut funding to local governments and to schools and that set strict limits on collective bargaining for public sector workers. Over the next 14 months or so, a state that's typically known for its niceness, Wisconsin and the Midwest, typically very nice people in a nice place, became embroiled in bitter, bitter fighting. Campaigns were started by each political party to recall state legislators of the opposite party, and Democrats were actually successful in forcing a gubernatorial recall election in the summer of 2012, which Governor Scott Walker survived. And while all of this was going on and neighbors starting to not speak to one another, small groups of people from both political parties were meeting in restaurants and pubs to have civil conversations about politics. The group had gotten started shortly after Governor Walker was elected in the fall of 2010. There were two people, two very liberal people living in the lib liberal bastion of Madison, Wisconsin. Katie Songer and Ron Dolan, who realized that they didn't really know any conservatives and they didn't understand conservative perspectives. They wondered to themselves why anyone would have voted for Governor Scott Walker. We may have similar thoughts about people of opposite political viewpoints at times. Why in the world would you vote for such and such person or believe X, Y, Z? And instead of just being befuddled by this question, Katie and Ron decided to actually find out the answer. So they contacted the local Republican Party headquarters to ask if anyone would be interested in meeting for friendly conversation about politics. And Carol and Scott Grabens got the email request and found it pretty intriguing, so they agreed. And the two couples began to meet every month over dinner. They would discuss various political issues, but they also simply got to know one another outside of politics. And their monthly dinners turned into a larger organization called Reach Out Wisconsin. The goal of the group isn't to change one another's viewpoints. It's simply to create a forum for people of drastically different views to engage in respectful dialogue and to truly understand one another. Katie Songer blogs about her experiences with these dinners and has shared the following reflection. I've come to see these meetings as not only a political undertaking, but a spiritual one. At each meal with Scott and Carol, I'm forced to depart from black and white thinking, reminded that there are good arguments and good people on both sides of politics. It feels deep down good, she says, to know that by doing this, I'm facing adversaries even more challenging and important than Scott Walker. One, the paralyzing rift in our country, and two, my own ego. In short, these meetings have confirmed for me that face-to-face -face dialogue is what the country needs right now. 
As I mentioned in a post last month when Ron and I described the meetings to Eileen Bruskowitz, the conservative candidate for county executive, she said, then you are doing God's work. Now that's one thing we can all agree on. And it is indeed holy and sacred work to build bridges between our divisions. Now you may not be in a position to build, to organize bipartisan forums across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but we can each meaningfully immerse ourselves in the diversity around us, even in simple ways. Kwame Anthony, Anthony Apaya is a professor of philosophy and the product of an interracial marriage in 1950s Ghana. And he suggests that rather than taking on differences in political positions or moral questions directly, we can try sidling up to differences by finding ways of having simple human encounters with others. One example of this happens in a British teen drama called Skins. There's a young, white, gay English teenager and a young Muslim English teenager of Pakistani descent and they're best friends. And the Pakistani teenager is having a birthday party and the friend arrives, his friend who is gay arrives at his home but stands outside and he says to him, I'm not coming inside because I asked you to tell your family that I am gay and you haven't done that yet. So this is my ultimatum, I'm just waiting out here. And he stands right outside the door. Finally, the father of the Pakistani teenager comes out and he asks him, what are you doing outside? And he says, I'm not coming in because your son hasn't told you yet that I'm gay. And the man looks at him and says, you know, Islam means a lot to me. And when I go to mosque on Fridays, it is the best part of my week. But I don't understand everything. One thing I do understand is that you are my son's best friend. So please come inside. There are a lot of things that we might not understand about why people do what they do, live the way they do, believe what they do. Yet in this colorful and chaotic bazaar that is our human community, each of us can be a peace builder by opening doors to those we may not understand, by building bridges and not walls. May we do so with open hearts and with open minds.